Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the concluding part of our Raids and Operations Week. And what a week it has been. We've done operations that didn't happen. Uh, David O'Keefe, memory, talking about Operation Ruthless. We did uh, Eric Lee talking about the plan to assassinate Hitler. We talked about the SOE in Crete yesterday. But now we are talking about a unit that has had other books about it. It's had films about it. Uh, but my guest today, Gavin Mortimer, has, has just publishing. It's out right now about Z special unit. Gavin Mortimer has written that book about a unit that has its origins in Australia, but lots of Brits involved, Kiwis involved as well. And we're going to discuss their legacy, what they're up to with a focus on operations in Borneo. But before I uh, bring Gavin into the show, as usual, if you are new to World War II TV, please don't forget to like the shows you're watching, leave us a comment, uh, share what we're doing on social media, and consider becoming a patron or YouTube member. And all the links you need, including the link to buying the, bo the book and Gavin's own website, are in the description below. So when you finish watching, open it up, and then everything you need there, merchandise links, book links, is all there to explore. Uh, so I'm going to bring him in now. So Gavin Mortimer is joining us. So good evening, Gavin. How are you today? Yeah, very well. Very well. Good to be here again. So, you know, you've tackled the SAS, Long Range Desert Group, uh, Special Forces. You've gone to the other side of the world with this one. So obviously we talked about the end of the previous experience, you know, you're having to use archives in multiple countries for this. So compared to other books you've done, was it more difficult to research? It, it was, it wasn't so much more difficult. The, I left it too late. You had the last survivor, for example, of Operation Jaywick, which, which was um, the most, uh, we might as well get this out of the way first. Uh, strictly speaking, um, operation Jaywick wasn't a, a Z special unit uh, operation. It was it was um, organised and funded from London, but I've included it in the book with a little note. But uh, but that um, that operation uh, Jaywick, the last survivor, Moss Berriman, died in I think it was the summer of two thousand and twenty. And in my my past books on, on the SAS, the SBS, the Long Range Desert Group, Merrill's Marauders. Um, I've spoken to schools of veterans um, like 25 years. So um, I managed to one uh, veteran, I've got a, I've got a, a name check, that's Michael Tibbs, who's uh, going strong at 100, and he was a lieutenant on the uh, Tauntalus, the submarine that went to collect the Remo party in um, November 1944. And um, and that was wonderful to to talk to, to someone who, who was – who was there and who was able to actually correct me on a couple of points. And there's a lot of, uh, and I address this in the book, uh, Rufus McKenzie, who was the, uh, the, the skipper of the um, Tauntalus, was, has been criticised by some historians for really for a, a dereliction of, of duty. And, uh, and Michael Tibbs um, was uh, uh, dismayed at, at that, uh, as was McKenzie in his lifetime. Uh, so that was very interesting to hear his point of view. So uh, to go back to your question, um, Paul, it wasn't, it, it, there's a lot of material out there, a bit of a challenge during lockdown, obviously. <laughs> so making an appointment in the National Archives, blimey, that was hard work. Um, but uh, so there's, 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 there's a great wealth of material out there. And I have to say, uh, the, the Australian archives are fantastic and ahead, yeah. I think, of the British archives in digitalising everything. So that was, um, they got an extraordinary treasure trove of photos and that was a great help no definitely and i mean we, we the australian archive is a great resource i should put the link in it uh, after the show because it's it's a great resource but we talked with kyle yesterday about soe and crete and we talked a little bit about a lot of those books that are written in the 50s and 60s by officers in certain special forces and units that at the time things were still shrouded in official secrecy and they were the kind of first to write these things and with some of these missions that we're talking about today, the first books were written quite a long time ago, and they they set a standard of, of I was there, I did this. But as you check these things out with the archives and things as the years go past, you realize some of these books, they, they've not deviated from the truth, so to speak, but they they, they tell things from a, from a point of view that perhaps we would now consider out of date. So as with the, your SAS and LRDG work, do you have to kind of, consciously search and separate between the myth and the reality you do absolutely and uh the the the, 
Z special units, um, particularly the the two, uh, Ivan Lyon was very good at keeping reports. If you if you compare him to David Sterling and and Paddy Main, who were were not good at uh, at keeping reports. Uh, same with Anders Lassen, Lassen of the SBS. Uh, Lyon, who you see there with a the moustache, was excellent. So was Donald Davison, who kept a diary. And it's a bit like, it was sort of reminding me a bit of Scott of the Antarctic, because his diary closes with, that's all I've got time for now. And that was, um, he wrote that on, uh, I think it was Parang Island, before they set off, uh, they, they'd uh, hijacked this uh, junk, and they'd, uh, which they were transporting the... Uh, the Sleeping Beauties, the submersible canoes uh, too. And and he closed the diary and he gave it to Walter Chapman, who was a, a Royal Engineer officer who was going back on the submarine. And so when you when you look at that diary, that's a, a wonderful source of, uh, of information, but it's quite poignant too. And and also the um, uh, the Imperial War Museum was very good at, um, uh, there's the letters of Bobby Ross, who was killed by Ivan Lyon and Sora Island in a last ditch stand against the Japanese and he he was a prolific letter writer and like so many of that generation so articulate so eloquent and he writes these long letters to his sister and and that's a good I mean that, that's what I find very useful because you've got the uh you've got the official operational reports and the training notes etc but when you get the letters um and diaries you can flesh out the characters and that's the sort of history I think that I try and and wrote, I tried to bring it alive through the through the men who were there, even if they'd been dead for th three quarters of a century. And um, and Bobby Ross um, was was someone I really uh, took warm to because he'd throughout he'd been in he'd been in uh, at Singapore and then he he'd escaped from Singapore and then he was posted as is so often the way in the British Army to this godforsaken backwater in uh, I think it was East Africa. And for two and a half years, and he, and he was so frustrated and he went back on a long leave in the beginning of 44 and said, I've got to see some action. And uh, and he ended up, because he spoke Malay, he ended up being recruited by Ivan Lyon to uh, Z Special Units. And um, uh, he got to war OK. But um, uh, and so that's that's uh, again, just bringing a personal story. In, into the into the context of the of the history of the unit and um and uh, so when you haven't got veterans alive to speak to that's the next best thing yeah so let's get back to the origins because as with any show about special forces that kind of predominantly are british there's that always that murky period at the beginning when they're trying to find their feet they have different labels different names different um um, aims and intentions and then you get that point by the middle of the war where they've kind of settled down with an identity because as we know it now Z special unit but they start off there's the inter-allied services department which is more about intelligence gathering so before we we leap to Borneo um, metaphorically speaking run us through the concept of where this this force was was um, created and for what well, I'm going to take you back even further, and I'm going to seamlessly link it to my um, book, uh, Bobby of David Sterling, which is uh, out next month, because this Z special unit can actually trace its origin. And this is why anyone who follows me on Twitter will know that I, um, I've i been um, blowing the trumpet of Bill Sterling very much as the, as the father of British Special Forces. So the story... Um, begins in April 1940, when six men uh, from uh, what was MIR, the forerunner of the SOE, uh, were sent to Norway on a uh, mission to link with the Norwegian partisans and to carry out some sabotage on the uh, uh, railway uh, south of Bergen. And en route, they hit a, uh, a, a surface mine, the submarine. They returned to Ross South. Uh, and then they had a two, they were told two or three days before we get a, a replacement submarine. Bill Sterling said, who was the laird of Kier, uh, Kier which is in near Dunblane, said, well, let's co we'll come back to my, uh, to my gaff, my vast estate, and we can, uh, we can kick back there for a couple of days. The, the actual mission was aborted. But what that did was that the, the six men, uh, one of whom was Jim Gavin, uh, who was on the 1936 Everest expedition, 
a uh, very young climber, very tough. Um, he was he was among the six, and they said to themselves, "Now this this mission was has been so poorly planned that we we don't know anything about guerrilla warfare." And Sterling had actually taken his um, his um, uh, gamekeeper with him to Norway for for uh, stalking for. Uh, uh, teaching them how to move uh, swiftly and, and noiselessly across uh, rough terrain. So that's the level, really, of, of ignorance that they had. And um, so Sterling was very well connected, went down to London and pitched this idea to the war office of a guerrilla warfare school. It got the go ahead. It opened in the uh, beginning of June 1940, the Special Training Centre at Lock Islet. And Jim Gavin, who was a, a role engineer officer, was one, uh, one of the officers, uh, one of the training instructors. He was a demolitions expert. He got his mate on, uh, Mike, uh, name I'm sure you're familiar with. And um, so they were there for about, uh, well, in, in Gavin's case, Jim Gavin's case, he was there until um, early 41 when he was sent out to Singapore to open up a Singapore branch of the uh, a special training center so he named this uh, 101 school and it opened up it opened for business in the summer of uh, 1941 and one of the uh, uh, students was Ivan Lyon and so that's really the origins of Z special unit so jumping forward a year to uh, 1942 obviously after the fall of Singapore and two SOE officers majors Mott and um, Traps uh, Lomax uh, came to Australia and opened up um, uh, an Australian branch of SOE, so SOE Australia, and to, to really uh, fulfil a similar role to, role to SOE in Europe. And in 1943, that then became um, uh, SOA, Special Operations Australia. That was then reconstituted um, services reconnaissance department in may 1943 and z special unit was never actually a war establishment it was just a, uh, an administrative title for a holding unit for um, soldiers from the australian uh, volunteers from the australian army so they never thought of themselves as z special unit um, and if you ever hear someone say oh yeah they were z men that was only uh, after the war that they were referred to as Z-men. Um, they were just known as a rather prosaic um, SRD, Services Reconnaissance Department. Um, and it was also yet yeah, very murky. So, um, as you said, it absolutely, Paul, it's, it was very um, sort of nebulous and, and how it came to being. And it sort of went through the ringer several times until in um, 1943, it became... Uh, what we know as as or, or what we think of as special units, um, and their their main role really was uh, intelligence gathering, um, setting up uh, training guerrilla armies of, with the indigenous population, and um, coast watching. Uh, so then there there were scores of, of little operations, and and in the book uh, I couldn't I couldn't do justice to to so many if I if I try to cover. Uh, those operations. So I concentrated on on Jaywick, uh, Remal, and then um, uh, Python and Semet, which were in Borneo. Python was uh, in 1943, and then uh, that was by Major, led by Major Francis Chester, who was a uh, uh, a very good one of the things that. Um, striking about Z Special Unit in, in terms of, uh, it's, it's worth just spending a couple of minutes on this, the composition of a unit. You tended to have British officers, so the likes of Ivan Lyon, um, Donald Davidson, Frank Chester, Tom Harrison, who we'll get to later, Bill Soshan again, who was in uh, Semet. And, but the, the men were overwhelmingly Australians, one or two um, British soldiers, uh, one or two um, New Zealanders, but um, the majority were, were Australians. And, and they had a, a, a good balance. The British officers tended to be older. So for, for Borneo, for example, um, Harrison was, was in his 30s. Bill Soshan, an ex-prison officer at Wormwood Scrubs, was 
44. Chester was 40. But they were selected because they had they'd lived in Borneo. So they could speak um, the, the dialect. They knew, um, and most importantly, they knew the area. But most importantly, they knew the customs. They knew the people. Um, and that was that would that would prove very important indeed. And um, so that was the uh, so summit then, which was launched in uh, 1943. There were four parts to it: one uh, summit, one summit, two summit, three, and and summit four. And um, it was that was uh, prior to the. Um, invasion, the, the 9th Australian Division, their invasion of, of Borneo. Borneo, um, very important for the oil, for the Japanese who invaded it, um, uh, I think it was the 16th of December in 1941. By 1944, 40% uh, of their, of their um, oil was coming from Borneo. And so it was, it was very important for the Japanese and very important for the Allies to deprive them of that oil, but also as a um, it, its location in the South China Sea was was important for in, in a wider context in, of a, in the war in, in Japan. Um, and um, again, just a, a bit of background about Borneo. It was divided into five regions. You can see them out there. So the the north was um, British North Borneo. Borneo was uh, um, in the um, run by the British before the war, and then you had the Dutch uh, in the south. And in general, it had been, as far as colonisation ever can be, it had been fairly benign, and um, the British had, had tended just to be in, in Brunei and the coast, um, east and west, nether in the interior. Uh, the, the, the first, one of the first missionaries had gone into the interior in their rather um patronize you know, well-meaning but patronizing way oh the heathens the heathens um but but arguably the first man who went into the interior with um with a real desire to connect with the locals uh was tom harrison when he was a at uh, oxford university in 1932 he is an anthropologist and he had a a fascination with with these remote tribes. And so he went in there, pierced the interior, and his knowledge uh, 13 years later would prove invaluable. And this is the thing, isn't it, about the the, the role of, of forces in this part of the world is different to perhaps how we think of SOE and different forces in countries like France or Denmark or Norway, where there's much more infrastructure, much more of a population who are aware of, of what is going on in the war, because Borneo, it's pretty remote in terms of that 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 central part of it there. For those who don't know it, you've got Malaya as it was there, Malaysia over to it to the left, and then you've got New Guinea over to the right or to the to the east. But Borneo kind of was 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 pretty remote. I mean, as you say there, that the fact that the people who were brought into to the to, to Z unit were, were those who'd been there before the war, because it's as we'll talk about later on, it hearts and minds comes into it. Because I remember reading as a kid all about those. Those battle the, the battles the British fought in the fifties and sixties in players like Malaya and the, and it, Hearts and Minds and SAS. That's really what a lot of the role of uh, it, it, of was, the, was these units was was not so much going in and blowing things up, although there was a bit of that. It was about establishing intelligence. So so remind remind us for those who don't know. These have got some images here. What well, well tell us what this aerial image for, for, for first is. Well, the, the rivers are crucial to Borneo, the interior of Borneo. That's how they that's how they um, travel in rivers, and you can they they quite fast. You know, the three or four knots, you get large crocodiles down there. Um, and uh, in fact, there's one one story I read of a uh, of a Z special unit man. They they captured a Japanese officer. And they were transporting him back in the prow, which is the the, the, the native boat. And um, he just uh, he he was hands tied behind his back, and he just uh, dived off into the water. There were some crocodiles on the bank, and that was his form of you know, getting out of either the dishonor of being captured. And um, so, um, but the jungle too. It's I mean, it's it's the, so Borneo is the third largest island in the world after. Greenland and New Guinea. I met I knew Greenland. I had to uh, I had to look up the second one. Um, and um, the peak, the highest peak, is nearly fourteen thousand feet. But it's just thick, thick jungle 
um, in in the interior. It rains. It can rain up to I think it's about two hundred inches of rain a year, uh, and it rains. There's not a rainy season. It rains constantly, um, and uh, obviously diseases rife, uh, malaria, dysentery, uh, and various fairly nasty skin diseases. Now, one thing that the Z Special Unit men remembered, the veterans remembered very well, you had trails in the jungle. If you stepped off that trail within five meters, you could find yourself hopelessly lost. And even the even the indigenous population, the diet they're known, um, would would sometimes get lost and they'll just wander around and around and eventually they'll die. They'll die. Um, so yeah, I mean, as you can see there, it's it's a pretty formidable uh, terrain there. And that's, I think, one of the things that is so, for me, is so um, uh, admirable about Z Special Unit. And that they, it, again, going back, actually, to, like, it's amazing how everything's linked to starts at Lock Island and the Special Training Centre in Scotland. Um, because one of the instructors was Freddie Spencer Chapman. Uh, that name will, will ring a bell for some of you, I'm sure. And he wrote the uh, uh, Imperious, uh, The Jungle is Neutral, which if you haven't read it, I recommend it. He spent two and a half years behind Japanese lines in Malaya, fighting more or less a single-handed battle with the help of Chinese communists. Um, and his, so The Jungle is Neutral, his, his philosophy was um, that... It, respect the jungle, but don't be afraid of it. And I think that's very similar to Ralph Bagnold of the Long Range Desert Group, because talking to, to uh, in fact, he, he he died just a couple of weeks ago, Lofty Car raced 101, who was uh, um, uh, one of Bagnold's um, earliest recruits to wire patrol and uh, a first navigator. And and he, he, um, he would sometimes drive Bagnold out for parleys with the um, Zanussi headman. And um, they, would, uh, they would give tea and, um, and uh, food. And in return, they would uh, uh, relay intelligence about the Italians or the German movements and about routes in the desert. Um, so he, that was, um, uh, I mean, Bagnold was very good at understanding um, that, the de and he was a desert explorer, that don't be afraid of a desert is what he told the Long Range Desert Group. Respect it, but, but utilise it. And that, that really was what Freddie uh, Spencer Chapman, Mike Calvert, Tom Harrison, and the other um, Z Special Unit officers who had Toby Carter in New Zealand, who I forgot to mention, who worked in the oil industry in Borneo before the war, was another uh, a, a very fine officer. Um, and, and that was what they imparted to the men. And you know, a lot of the men were 20, 21-year-old Australians, students, um, brickies, um, whatever, before the war. And um, uh, here you see some of them there. Toby Carter's in the middle. Um, um, yeah, yeah, Bill Soshin is third from left, as, as I look at it. But, and um, and uh, so, and they did. And I think uh, if, if you try and put yourself in the shoes of uh, a 20, 21 year old Australian from Sydney or Perth or Melbourne uh, who's parachuted into the Borneo interior um, and they're greeted by, uh, as they were in the, the advance party of, of uh, uh, Semit, in, um, which is the Malay for ant, by the way, uh, in March 45. They're greeted by four. Um, Diet warriors with uh, um, leopard teeth in their ears, the loincloth, and uh, um, their parangs, these very fierce mach uh, machettes. And uh, um, it, it must have been a pretty frightening experience. Um, but they weren't frightened by it. That's, that's the key. They, they sort of embraced it, to use a modern vernacular. Mm. And um, But also, that, of course, the training. They had a lot of training in up in Cairns and in... Uh, um, uh, Fraser Island of Queensland, so they were pretty confident too, um, and uh, and this is where we get into the, the hearts and minds. I'll, I'll let you uh, interrupt, um, Paul, or or come back at me, but but certainly this is where we we get to the, the very controversial figure of Tom Harrison and, and the whole hearts and minds. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I just want to say that, you know, when we talk about these these organisations in their fledgling era, when they're going through different names and the purposes are changing, it's because they need to find the right personnel who can give them the ideas because it's all very well some offices in Whitehall saying, or in Sydney through Melbourne, saying we need to do something in Borneo. You need someone who can say what can be done in Borneo, someone who knows Borneo, someone who knows these areas. You can say, well, what you could do is this. So I can see that these sorts of organizations are personality driven rather than kind of doctrine driven because you need those ideas for people like you say, who, who are not frightened by the jungle. So, so set the scene for us in terms of Borneo, you say, vital in terms of the oil o- occupied by the Japanese. But we're talking late in the war before the Allies consider going back in. So so set the scene about about uh, the, the Z Special Unit and what they're doing compared to the, the Allied forces generally in that era, area. area. Sorry. OK, before I do that, um, Paul, you just that, that's a very good point you just raised there. And I've, I've looked this out. This is just want to read you something. This was notes from uh in the in the mike calvert papers um super and um it just it, this is about the sort of now obviously he was uh to us here but cheated, it's uh to win gay win i mean that's interesting i know you've spoken um before on your show about uh, uh win gay and you know how effective he um uh, i'm i'm more a, a calvert fan than a, a wingate fan but this is what calvert writes about the first chinder operation in 1943, this first operation proved that the European soldier, as a can shake off the shackles of his civilized neuroses and inhibitions and live and fight as hard as any Japanese. And due to his intrinsic sounder constitution and basic health, due to good feeding, better the Japanese in overcoming hard conditions. Most Europeans do not know what their bodies can stand. And it is the mind and willpower which so often gives way first. Most soldiers never realised that they could do the things they did and hardly believe it now. One advantage of exceptionally hard training is that it proves to a man what he can do and what he can suffer. Which I think is vital, um, particularly when you're talking about uh, jungle warfare, um, for the reasons we've just said. It's such environment and you know there's uh, oh there's snakes and there's tigers and uh, and um so it's it's um it, it's that it's the training but it's also instilling in the men the the self-belief that they can do it that they they can survive not only survive but they can thrive in this environment um so going back to borneo then uh is in february 1945 that um well actually Ever since Borneo had been occupied by the Japanese in December 41, the Allies had been contemplating um, launching some sort of guerrilla campaign in Borneo, but they they didn't know how to do it. There was for the reasons that we've just talked about: the interior, very formidable, um, lack of men, etc. And then in 1944. Initially, it was going to be launched in. Uh, so it was always that the plan was before the invasion. And they knew that they had these the the indigenous population were very anti-Japanese because of the appalling way they'd been treated. And and they'd been half starved. There'd been massacres. I mean, the Japanese, we talk about hearts and minds. I mean, absolutely no idea throughout the war about hearts and minds. Um, and um, initially, that, that they had thought of, of launching a guerri- um, uh, some form of guerrilla uh, campaign, um, or rather inserting um, men in order to train the locals to set up a, um, a uh, intelligence gathering network uh, from the east to the west coast, um, right through the interior. And at the same time, uh, beginning to to group and to train the the tribes, um, the disparate tribes within North Borneo. In the end, um, that wasn't launched until uh, March, where it didn't really go into begin to the wheels didn't go get it set into motion until February forty five, and then March, middle of March forty five is when the advance party inserted um, in in Barrio, which. Um, means plane of plane of the wind um in the local dialect and uh um and that was very much with a view to to 
um, prior to the to the main Australian invasion, which was uh, in June the 10th, um, uh, to to get this guerrilla army um, effectively trained and and then hit the Japanese um, in the rear, coming at them from the uh, from the interior towards the uh, the north uh, northwest coast, um, and so the advance party of eight went in under under Tom Harrison. Uh, Tom Harrison has some of you may be familiar with know of the mass observation archive. It was held at Sussex University, uh, and that was uh, again an anthropological anthropological study forgive my pronunciation, that was uh, set up in 1937 by Tom Harrison, who was only at the time in his mid-20s. He was a precocious man. He was an intellectual. Um, and it was Britons would uh, keep a diary of their everyday lives. And it ran, I think, until the early 50s. And it's fascinating for anyone wanting to study the home front during the war. Fascinating. Because they're, they're very mundane and banal observations. But but at the same time, they give this insight into, into how the war, uh, particularly the Blitz, affected uh, the, the British mindset. Anyway, so Tom Harrison led the advance party in. Now, Tom Harrison was uh, universally disliked by the seven Australian uh, soldiers with him, NCOs. And in fact, uh, Jumbo Courtney, who was uh, Lieutenant Jumbo Lieutenant Colonel Jumbo Courtney, who was in command of A Group, which is the liaison between Z Special Unit in Borneo and the 9th Australian Division. Uh, it was a great quote where he was he was uh, remembered bitterly by some and uh, in bemusement by others. Um, but it's interesting when you when you read later uh, recollections of veterans many years later, i.e. when they're old men. They, they still think he was a shit, but quite a wise shit. So he was 10 years older than, than most of them. And he was, he, he urged them, or actually ordered them to, to go native. So he was very loath to give them, to let them eat their army rations. He wanted them to live off the land, um, to eat pig as the, uh, the Dyaks did, and to eat on their, their rice diets. Uh, to go around in um, barefoot uh, and just really to to adopt the customs um, of the indigenous population. And this caused some resentment at first, but then on reflection after the war, they thought, yeah, they, the veterans saw the sense of that. And he wasn't a fighter, um, uh, Tom Harrison. He wasn't a soldier, but he was very good at winning the hearts and minds. And there's a quote he said, the, this is in a newspaper article just uh, in the late 40s. The best way to get on anywhere is to behave as the natives do. Respect their manners and customs. You gain respect if you fraternize. Learn to dance their dances, sing their songs, drink their chiefs under the bamboo table. Which is very important because they love their rice wine, uh, the Dax. Um, Dax is the collective name for the for the various tribes. It means upland in the local dialect. And uh, um, there were several um, uh, tribes, but they were collective name was Dax. And um, and that was, and they loved, so Borak was their uh, rice wine. And um, uh, there was there were some great stories of veterans remembering um, booze ups in the longhouse. Uh, in, in your, in the interior of Borneo, the longhouse would be built 15 uh, feet above ground. The pigs would live underneath the uh, uh, the longhouse, and it was you had a it was had a div division um, lengthways, and on the veranda uncovered lived the bachelors uh, or slept the bachelors and the visitors, and then inside undercover slept the families. And there was no partition, so you just lived. They didn't believe in um, in um, in sort of private space, so you had. In um, Barrio, which is the village where they were based, um, Tom Harrison's uh, Semit One, there were 57 people in this one one longhouse. So you really had to, you know, be quite tolerant of your of idiosyncrasies, etc. Um, and um, 
But but that's what um, uh, Tom Harrison insisted his men do, and it worked because initially, when the, when they inserted, uh, and word came that uh, eight white men had had uh, had landed a couple of miles away, the village elders gathered, and they gathered to discuss what to do. Now there were two options: kill the white men and um, feed their bodies to the pigs. And that would mean a nice quiet life. The Japanese would, uh, the Japanese rarely pass through, but if they did, nothing to worry about. Good, because just, just um, to jump in here, Gavin, because if, if yeah. we look at other areas where the Japanese occupy, there's not a massive Japanese presence on Borneo, and where it is, it's concentrated on where they need it for the resources. It's in the, you know, on the coast where the oil and things are going out of that interior area there. Basically, the Japanese are leaving it alone. It's not like some other theatres where the Japanese are moving convoys through all the time or they're, they're patrolling. If you were living in that central area there as a Dayak local, you could kind of just exist there without the war really um, affecting you. Is, is that pretty much it? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And that's right. So uh, so that, that the easier choice, that's right, just to continue with the quiet life. You know, once in a while... Uh, a Japanese patrol may pass through a, a river patrol, um, but um, um, and the other the other option was to was to assist. They they knew that the white men were, were here to help them. Now it's very I mean it's interesting because again coming back to what uh, we mentioned earlier about the the British occupation of, of Borneo um, uh, from the nineteenth century up until nineteen forty one, they had actually been quite quite benign and and they brought education to uh, to certainly to the coastal regions as you just mentioned um but the, the chief um of uh, barrio uh, had had a one he'd had a uh, quite a violent dispute with a, another headman from a village and it, this had ended up being uh, uh, adjudicated by the um by the british and they found against the um the 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 chief of the of barrio village and uh, his punishment was it was a certain number of hours of community service gardening looking after the flower beds of the governor and so this this uh, he he found this quite bizarre but he actually came away thinking you know these british are you know slightly mad but they're all you know in their way they're quite you know, they're, they're not too bad and so he had a sort of a soft spot for the british um, but also he, they, they'd heard tales um, of, uh, of the atrocities carried out by the Japanese, particularly in the, the, the Iban with the, uh, with the indigenous population who li lived um, more on the coast, along the, the northwest coast. And so they were not well disposed towards the, uh, towards the Japanese. And of course, they just resented the fact that they, they had brutally occupied their um, islands and, and were starving them. And uh, so... So they um, they one and once you see one once you're befriended by a dark that's it um, you're you're a you're a friend for life and uh, the the loyalty was was immense and very 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 few cases of any betrayal by a dark um, during mm. the war during the occupation. So just to kind of bring in the military side of things, let, let you have a bit of water. You know, at this point in the war, by 44, 45, the Allies are routinely taking back islands and territories that have been occupied by the Japanese with varying levels of success. And we're also bypassing some. And we can list off all the ones, you know, Guadalcanal and so on and so on and so forth and Tarawa and everything. But the, the landings can be incredibly costly. When we've had people on talking about the Australians in New Guinea, uh, the landings there, costly, costly combat there. Sending in a team of specialists is a, is potentially a force multiplier, isn't it? Because you're adding intel, intel to when the invasion comes or at the, concurrently with the invasion, you've got boots on the ground in country who can say, don't do this, approach from this direction. There's something here. There's an airfield there. So, you know, the, the potential benefits of sending these teams is huge, but but the potential risk to them, as you say there, of they could just be killed because they're white folks is also huge. So the hearts and minds aspect, I'm aware that we've used that phrase a couple of times. I started it without really explaining what it is, because I, if I'm correct, if I'm correct, hearts and minds wasn't really established as a phrase until after the war. But that's kind of what they were doing. And it was particularly comes in 
it, you know, with the SAS later on. But what? How would you define hearts and minds? It's quite simply winning over the local population to onto your side and to to get them not only uh, actively um, uh, assisting you in the um, uh, in the fight against the enemy, but just having that foundation of support that you can go to them that they will give you shelter that so more passive support they will give you shelter they may give you food they may show you where to get water and um and you do that and it, it's 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 interesting because if you if you go back to um to to the desert and as i mentioned earlier bagnold was very good at that the SAS weren't. David Sterling uh, wasn't very good at that. And I would actually also criticise the SAS in France in 1944. Paul, I know you're, uh, uh, like me, a Francophile and know the country uh, well. And everyone knows, anyone who's ever been to France, particularly if you've been visiting the, the um, some of the, uh, the First or the Second World War battle sites, you'll pass through the little village. And always prominent is the Mairie. So the... Uh, the little the uh, the mayor's building. Every village has one. Every town has one. And it's a uh, you know in in Britain we think of mayors as wearing the jingly janglies, big funny hat, and um and that's it. And very just ceremonial and, and nothing else. But in France, you know, they're pillars of the community, and to snub them is not good. Um mm. and and the SAS didn't really understand this. And I remember I um I think it was Duncan Riddler who was the who was a fluent French speaker, who was the intelligence section in the, uh, well, there were only about three of them in uh, in one SAS, said that it was really frustrating because Paddy Main would never, you'd have a van d'honneur where you'd stop and you'd have a little uh, a glass of wine or something stronger with the uh, um, with uh, with the mayor. And, and, and Paddy Main didn't really have time for this, but it's very important because it is, it's hearts and minds. And, yeah. and if you get the mayor on your side, then he... He, they're going to be much uh, more cooperative, and if whereas if you snub them, they can you know their their Gallic pride can be uh, can take a bit of a um, uh, yeah can they can just take it the wrong way, and who knows what might happen. So um, so so it, but it's particularly important. France is not too bad because you can live off the land easily, etc. But in a place like Borneo, um, it's it's absolutely crucial that you. That you that you win over the local population because without them you need you need their help not just to uh, defeat the Japanese but just to, to survive from day to day, and the way that the um, what what Z Special Unit had uh, were medical supplies and the medic who in the advance party um, Jack Treadra uh, an Australian who was uh, uh, considered uh, by Harrison as, as the most important mission, a man on the, on the mission. He brought with him his medical bag. And on the first day, he launched this, uh, a, an old man came to him in his, with a groin, a boil about the size of a tennis ball. And he, he launched it and it was causing him agony. And he launched it and he said, you know, it was like a gallon of pus came out. And um, but the next day, this old man, it was sort of, he wasn't quite singing and dancing, but he was certainly, you know, he came to him and tears in his eyes. And and that's it, you know, bang, he's he's your friend for life. And he was treating dysentery and diarrhea and malaria um, and just generally cuts that wouldn't heal. And it's it's so important. And uh, and and it's what Semit was so good at. And um and then Jack was sent off really around the interior of, of Borneo to all these different villages uh, with his medical supplies. And, and um, he was a huge success. So it's, it's, it's that really. It's, it's just nothing simpler than, as, as it says, it's winning the hearts yeah. and, and the mind so that they, they not only uh, are, are affectionate towards you, but they will give you their intelligence to help beat the enemy. Yeah, it's giving giving them something first before you want to take something back from them. And, and without going into the, the wrongs of the British Empire, the British, we did have a bit of a tendency over the previous century to go to places and tell them to do things the way we've been doing and set up these mini Englands overseas. 
which kind of sort of worked on a large scale. But in this kind of scale in World War Two, it's impossible to go in there and tell them how to do things when you're going into their country with their customs and their way of doing things. So it, it, it makes sense. But at the time, it was quite quite a novel concept. So bringing it back to the purposes of of of, of the force over there. So you, you win over the hearts and minds and then you can start not only getting the intelligence from them, you can actually create a force of people uh, himself because that's one of the things I was particularly liked about your book is the is the training of the of these of these locals to actually use weapons uh, assist the the patrols there. So how did that start off and how did it how did it how effective was it? Well, they had the. I mean, it's, it's very interesting to see the. Uh, is, also, the photo there. So they had Austins, Owens, Brens, the three hundred three. There was um. Uh, who was I think it was Tom Harrison was saying that they're, they're actually within they you know that again we the, the Western attitude particularly back then was oh these these people going around in their loincloths and they 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 can't read or write they're they're just you know they're clueless about everything and yet they could they could uh, within a couple of weeks they could um, strip and assemble a Bren gun in under half an hour which amazed Harrison. Now, they weren't to, with a machine, what they loved was the, the noise of the, when you fired a weapon. But the problem was they would just keep their finger down, a uh, finger on the trigger. So with a with a submachine gun, it was, uh, you know, they would go through a lot of ammunition. But they were actually, they were much better. They, um, Z Special Unit preferred to give them a 303s. And they were good shots um, with a 303. There was one funny story uh, of, I think it was Keith Barry who was um, in, in Zemet 1 who said that um, in one of his first patrols they saw uh, in the in the distance uh, a Japanese patrol and one of the um, Daks fired his rifle in the air and then was a bit nonplussed when the Japanese started firing back because he presumed that once you make the noise, the bang, the enemy would run away and um, because that's that's you know, that's the diocese of, you, know, you got to imagine it from their point of view. And most of them, I doubt any of them had ever seen, certainly never held or fired a gun and probably never seen one. And suddenly they've, they've got these, uh, you know, a Bren gun. Um, but of course, from a British point of view, um, it was the, the blowpipe and, uh, and the parang, which they found particularly effective. Now, Tom Harrison, uh, no, so the, the blowpipe, about eight feet long, uh, I think it was, it was a one-inch hole that they'll drill through the through the middle. I mean, this, these things were a work of art. The the darts were a seven inches long, and the poison would be from the uh, the milky sap uh, of the ipo tree, uh, which is deadly poisonous. Uh, if if it hit a pigeon, uh, the pigeon would drop dead within five seconds. Monkey in about five minutes. And a human being in about 20 minutes. And Tom Harrison, who'd seen uh, uh, a Japanese die from a, um, a poison dart, said it was a terrible thing. It was sort of this creeping paralysis and excruciating pain. Uh, and the Japanese, it, they you know, talk about psychological warfare. They were absolutely terrified of these um, uh, of a poison darts, which were accurate uh, over about 25 yards and fairly accurate over about 50 yards. Um, and the, they were particularly good in, in, in ambushes because, as I mentioned earlier, you had these trails through the jungle, which are only, uh, you could only have one, uh, one abreast because they were so narrow. So they were perfect for, um, for, for launching ambushes. And you'd have half a dozen darks at the, at the front of the um, uh, ambush, half a dozen at the at the back I and mean, then a couple sort of in the middle and the Japanese were was sort of as terrified of of stepping off the trail as they were of the poison darts so they just sort of were frozen like that and it was uh it was a uh, like um a duck shoot really um and also the other thing one has to mention is the the head hunting head hunting which should, in, in terms of psychological warfare which the the ducks were very were actually I think quite pleased because it had been it had been phased out by the British who thought it was very distasteful. And so really by by the 1930s, headhunting was more or less uh, 
uh, had become consigned to history. But uh, Tom Harrison uh, brought it back and the Dax were very pleased with this. And um, with, with their parang was a photo you saw earlier of these, these, these wonderful um, uh, machettes that were uh, had a razor sharp there. There's one there. And uh, they would love to, to take the heads off. Uh, initially, before the, the Japanese, it was um, it was it was a bit like I suppose the say the the Lakota scalping in the um, an enemy in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Um, it was uh, for for young bloods. It was a sign of of their virility, of their manhood, and they would actually present them to um, to the object of their affection, the the woman they were courting, um, as as saying, "Listen, this is the sort of man you'll be marrying." And Tom Harrison and a lot of the Zemet boys said, "One, well, what they would do was after they after they locked the heads off the Japanese, they would bring them back and they would have a ceremony in the longhouse that evening. And the women would um, would feed the um, uh, would would feed rice to the heads. They'll put their heads in the longhouse <laughs> and they'll feed rice to the heads. And then afterwards, when they uh, when they all began getting stuck into the rice wine, the borak, they would then smoke the heads." And you'd hang them in a curved arc um, at the, on the veranda of a longhouse. And Tom Harrison is a great lion saying, you know, no matter how many times I've walked up the uh, climb the ladder of a longhouse onto the veranda, I will never get used to, as you come up to the top, staring into the dismal eyes of another skull. So it must have been fa fairly disconcerting wow. to the British. Imagine how disconcerting it was to the Japanese. So if you put those three together then, the, you, you had the 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 the, the blowpipes um, and the the parangs and the um, uh, and and then the the weapons that were dropped into the uh, to Z special unit in these special specially formed containers, torpedoes, um, and they they built up and two inch mortars. Uh, they built up a fairly formidable arsenal in the in the three months before um, because they were under their their instructions were. Not to not to attack the Japanese until the the main Australian landings on on uh, June the tenth. Which brings us to the point of you know, when the actual Allied invasion comes, these guys are already there. And if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, mm. it's about a hundred uh, men have been inserted. So the, the Z special unit guys are inserted there. They've now got the locals on board with them, trained some of them up there, and there to kind of try and restrict Japanese transport across the rivers and the trails, things like that, and then harass and attack in conjunction with the main landing so that when the main landings come in, the Japanese are attacked from the coast and essentially from inland as well. And the thing from reading your book and reading other stuff is that it was highly successful because as we know, and someone like yourself who has studied special forces for basically your entire life, measuring the success of these units can be problematic we talked about that on the previous show because so often i've had done shows with neil chair and others these early commando raids are more about instilling a for a message of hope to the people of the of the of britain as it is to actually causing a damage to the enemy or giving giving the fear to the enemy but in this case this was a very very successful operation wasn't it so so run us through just exactly how successful it was and how it assisted with the landings yeah, I mean, absolutely. The you know the, for the return, sort of a cost return. In in other words, how it was a very eighty two officers and men in total on Semit, right. and they trained a guerrilla army within three months of two thousand strong, and they killed uh, approximately one thousand five hundred uh, Japanese and and demoralized many more. They took quite a few prisoners, which uh, um, just 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 through the um, what, what we talked about earlier, um, the, the psychological aspects, and just and just hitting them from the interior, and and also it, attacking them at night time, um, and just just in small groups, so no large scale attacks, um, and um, and more often than, than not, the Japanese would always, of course, stick as they were retreating um, from the main inland and down the uh, down the coast south. Uh, they from the main Australian landings, they would they were sticking to the rivers, and so they would attack uh, the um, Zemet, Z Special Unit and their two thousand strong guerrilla army would attack. Um, th th there would be a waterborne uh, attacks on the river, and they would just sail by 
uh, in in their um, prows in their in their wooden boats and very quickly and just open fire. So this was you know, midnight, three o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning. Just you know a long burst from the Bren gun, for example, where the Japanese were camped. So it wasn't so much about killing; it was about wearing them down, and it mm. was about demoralizing them. And, and that's what they did so effectively to the point where um, in August, Bill Soshin took the surrender of a Japanese at um, uh, Cebu, the, the, the town south of, um, um, of, of, of Brunei. Uh, the, the Japanese surrendered because they just had enough. And, and it was very funny, Bill Soshin, who he was, he was the ex-prison officer, he was the 44-year-old who uh, who was dropped in um, through his knowledge. He'd been in the prison service in uh, Borneo, in North Borneo in the 30s. And uh, he kept a diary in a very funny account of when he went in, the Japanese said, would like to discuss surrender terms. So he took uh, about three of his men from um, Z Special Unit. And of course, the Japanese uh, were under the uh, assumption that they were up against a much larger force. And mm. um, so Bill Soshin they agreed that they would take the surrender and then the Japanese would march from the, uh, um, uh, from the, from the city center onto the island, across a bridge onto the island where they would then be, um, uh, 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 they would then take a boat further down the, down the coast. It, he wasn't actually taking their surrender. They were surrendering the, the town to him. And when he, when he came in with his, uh, he said, be on the island by four o'clock. And so when he came at four o'clock with his band of about 25 strong, uh, a mix of Z Special Unit and um, Dayak guerrilla fighters, and when the Japanese commander, they all dropped their weapons at the uh, on one side of the bridge and walked over. When he saw who had defeated him, it, Bill Soshin said he was hopping mad. He's he never seen someone so so ashamed, so furious and so ashamed because they'd been beaten by this yeah, ragtag army, so to speak. Certainly from the outside, that's what they looked like. But but of course, they were anything but. They were they were highly trained and, and highly motivated. And so they did a, they did a fantastic job. That's right. Just just 82 um, Z special unit men uh, in, in a it's, it's, it really it's one of for me, it's one of the most formidable special forces operations of the war in terms of what they achieved. But it's, it's, it's also, we might come on to this shortly, um, Paul, but it's interesting to, to see too the animosity that existed between Z Special Unit and the 9th Australian Division. All right, okay. Um, uh, which was based on what? Because now, now, now my ears are pricked up. If I, if, based if that based on that. I don't or... remember that bit particularly. On, on ignorance and the fact that um, they uh, they resented these um, these irregular, uh, rather in their eyes, unkempt, undisciplined guerrilla fighters who didn't did things their way, didn't take orders, and, and had that discipline. Um, and again, I'm, gonna, I'm mentioning him again because he's in my head. Mike Lofty Carr of a long range desert group, well, as I said, died a couple of weeks ago. But he said, um, I tweeted a quote from him that he, when he said, We didn't, we, we, we were considered a rabble, the long range desert group. And we didn't have, it's true, we didn't have army discipline, but we had LRDG discipline. Now, mm. you know, the SAS will say we, we had SAS discipline, SBS discipline, and Z special unit had it, Z special unit discipline. But there's a very, and again, the other thing that uh, I think there was also a slight resentment or, uh, um, on the the easy uh, and the very equal relationship between Z special units and the Dikes, because yeah. a lot of these officers, even though they were Australians, they were still um, rather uh, um, hoity-toity, and they thought, what what are, what are you doing? You know, sort of. Um, on, on such uh, an equal footing with these um, with these heathens quotes, and um, there's a very again that's what Tom Harrison said. He said uh, to his men, he said, "Never ever shout at a Dyak or 
or give the impression that you know better than they do. You talk to them as an equal and they will respect you far more than if you shout and if you come across as to have a swaggering sort of arrogance, um, which is a, a, you know applies, I think, to any similar situation when you're when you're working with the indigenous population, particularly in a in a, in a military context. And um, and at one point there was a funny story of um, uh, when the the uh, a, a unit of a, a platoon of uh, a company of of the Ninth Australian Division um, really. Were at loggerheads with Z Special Unit and were and were then ordering about the dikes and and treating them really as dirt and so they took umbrage at this and they had a, a collaborator they caught a, one of the rare collaborators so they chopped off this collaborator's head and then left it in the cab of a truck belonging to the officer of this uh, platoon from the Ninth Australian. Army division. I mean, when he he was out in a patrol, when he got back and he opened up the truck and he he had hysterics and um, and of course the uh, the darks were all sniggering to themselves as was the, the Z Special Unit was. So it was a good good lesson I think learned there that uh, don't um, don't talk down to the uh, to the darks. No, definitely. And a couple of things came into my head when you were talking there. One is that. Um, you know, by the time we're talking about this invasion here, uh, May till August 1945, in the ETO, the war is, is now over. And a lot of special forces are kind of being, they're being wound down or they're trying to fight for their existence because it's a it's a generalization. But in the British and American Canadian armies, it's like the, the hierarchy, the old people, the old guard want to now get rid of all these special units and go back to the traditional ways of before the war because... It's all been very well using these irregular forces to defeat the enemy, but now the enemy are defeated. Let's go back to parade ground, you know, finesse and, and polishing our brasses and, and that way. So it, it is interesting that this era is falling in. Just as this unit is being very successful, special forces are now kind of fighting for their existence. And that's weird for younger people watching. If you if they think of the military these days, often special forces what they think of first because everyone loves a book about the Green Berets or the you know the, the SAS or the Delta Force, whatever it would be. But it, it, at the end of World War II, these things are winding down. The other thing I want to kind of uh, to tap you up on is 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 why this this operation in Borneo isn't better known. I mean, it will be now thanks to your book, but. Is it partly because of the fame of Operation Jaywick? And because Operation, I was just checking while I was talking, Operation Jaywick, which was the, you talked about it, the, the raid on Singapore and then Rimau that followed it. I mean, there's like 10 different books on Operation Jaywick. And obviously you cover it in yours. Uh, one film, one TV series, it's still being the subject of documentaries. That that has maybe taken the attention away from the, these other uh, important aspects of what said special force uh, did, or special unit. Then is that your kind of takeaway that Jaywick is is too well known? Maybe. Yeah, j quickly just to go back to your first point, which is a really good point. I, have to, I know, Paul, it's 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 fascinating that now from a British um, perspective about you know the, the dissolution of special forces, I think it was partly to do with the Attlee government. Churchill, yep. you know, the commandos had always been a champion and. And the Attlee government came in, and and just, but just generally there was a feeling, exactly as you said, that we've won the war now, and also a slight distaste could stretch this, of course, to Bomber Command too, that mm. we 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 won the war, and we don't want to think of the more unsavoury methods that we deployed, and so we're going to, and I mean, you know, you look in the nineteen fifties and over John Mills, these uh, these films of. Uh, uh, tally ho chaps it was very much their sort of a clean cut um you know dastardly jerry's and uh noble upstanding tommies etc uh, much more complex than that as we know um and the second point yeah i mean the second point is curious yeah yes yes with jaywick um uh i mean i think that, you know even the second operation the unsuccessful one would also make a, a rimo would also make a great story because uh yeah of, of the uh the, when they when the um, when they got uh, compromised and then the the flight and the final stand of what we mentioned earlier a lion and uh, and uh, uh, Donald Davison who and uh, Pat Campbell who took cyanide capsules which I think is another fascinating we haven't touched on that very quickly there all the Z special unit boys were given a cyanide pill 
um, uh, when they went on operations. There's Davidson and your Donald Davidson on your screen now. He was badly wounded, and he um, uh, when they fled the island of Sora. This was after the uh, uh, Rimar were being compromised, and uh, and um, they knew that there's no escape. So they took uh, he and Campbell laid sat down back to a rock and and took their cyanide pill, which I it was. It, it, I, I think about it so much you know, would to that finality how many of us would you know would actually take it and how many of us would surrender or fight it out to the last it, an extraordinary decision to both of them to take it um and um so but yeah i mean it's it's funny sir because it, it there's so much material there you know working with these with this, this extraordinary race the dax um and um uh and what they achieved because there was some pretty fierce fighting and some some fierce engagements on on the river ambushing patrols and um japanese patrol and you know the uh uh it, it, it fits so many it, it, or sort of yeah it, it it has so many aspects to it which i think would 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 intrigue because it, it is much more than just a um uh sort of a you know a fairly a, a war story um mm. it, it's it's about the interaction with with a with a population and 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 as you said the, the hearts and minds but just you know this extra the, the cooperation that then between emotionally and physically and intellectually that went on between these these young Australian men, um, most of them city boys, and and these people who most of them had never seen a, a, a white person before. And I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a tri tribute to both the Australians and the Dyaks that they were they were able so quickly to find this um, this 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 collaboration um, that was so fruitful. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, obviously you, you got the Forgotten Army in Burma and, and, and what did Borneo suffer from, from even more forgetfulness? Perhaps that's the answer. It, it does seem to fall in between, you know, new, for Australians, their focus is generally New Guinea and that goes on from Kokoda right the way up. And then we have Boona and the landings. Then we've talked about that with Australian historians like Philip Bradley. The British, I think that our focus is more on Burma. So Borneo kind of falls between those two campaigns, yeah. literally geographically and also in our memory. And I think also the fact that, that, that some, some success, some, famous commando i'm using that as a generic term raids are famous because they have a tragic end right now as you talk you know you just movingly talked about taking the cyanide pills there whereas the borneo operations were ultimately successful so maybe they were too yeah. successful to be famous because us british we do kind of like that that noble <laughs> death for a cause. I mean, I'm thinking about even the divers like Lionel Crabb out in the Mediterranean, the fact that he disappeared when the film was made about him, Silent Enemy in the 50s, it could end with it. He disappeared. That we, we kind of like that not a downbeat ending. You know, it's like 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 our yeah. obsession with Market Garden, that you know, something that yeah. went uh, wrong, whereas this that went well, maybe it's just well, too uh, successful to be famous. Absolutely. Uh, I didn't say that. I, I mentioned that how many they uh, semi, they, uh, 82, uh, 82 men were on the operation, and they and with their two thousand strong um, dark army, they accounted for one thousand five hundred Japanese. They didn't lose one man. Now, right. as yeah. a, in a way, I'm I'm a bit of a uh, I like my polar history. S look at Scott and Shackleton. Certainly, for the first sort of 50, 60 years, Scott was a hero. Because he died, because he died. yeah, yeah. He said, <laughs> we, we Brits love it. It's like that. Uh, the Monty is it the Monty Python, the futile sacrifice? We love yeah. that. And uh, whereas Shackleton, who never lost a man, and you know, he's in the news obviously because of those ex astonishing discovery of uh, the endurance a couple of months ago, he didn't lose a man on that on the endurance expedition, despite despite what they went through. Because he was same with Amundsen, even. I mean, Amundsen was. When he got to the South Pole, it was a bit of a breeze, really, and um, and um, so uh, yeah, that's right. Whereas Scott, who was a bit of a bungler, um, uh, it turned into a turned into a hero, and um, it's mm. I think I think that's a really good point that uh, it there's just something about you know our the, sort of the British mentality that we do love a, 
a plucky loser. We don't like things to be too successful. I mean, the similar thing I'm thinking of is I did a couple of shows with the American historian Lance Zedrick about the Alamo Scouts. And the Alamo Scouts, similar basic kind of concept to what we've been talking about today. And they, over numerous islands and numerous operations, didn't lose a single man. And again, that they're not quite as famous as perhaps Merrill's Marauders that you've written about and other units where there is this this death toll that kind of makes it interesting. You can't. It, it, the lesson we're learning is be successful in World War II, but not too successful. Otherwise, no one will talk about you. It's a it's a weird paradox there that you need to have some do, noble deaths to make it to make things interesting. It's a. Absolutely. I'm sorry if we're offending people with our flippant language there, but it you know as people who read lots of books, it is interesting why certain stories endure and others don't. Yeah. But which which leads me into a, a, a nice sort of final question for you is basically what are your hopes for the book? Because you said there, you know, there's there's no veterans around now. There's going to be some family members who are going to be hopefully uh, learning a bit more about what their their grandfathers and their great uncles things did. But more broadly speaking, because the the the, the, the majority of the books I've seen on Z Special Unit have been. Australian published, kind of aimed at an Australian audience. You know, you're British publishing it worldwide. So I guess you want the British to be more aware of this unit because it's seen, I think, as an Australian unit more so. So I guess that's one of your aims is for it to be known by the British. But t- tell us what you, your hopes are for the book. No, absolutely. To, to, I want to, um, yeah, Z Special Unit, well known in Australia, less. Even Jaywick is is slightly better known, but but certainly what Zemet and what went on in uh, uh, Borneo. Um, but I think too, you know, it's it's still very relevant today. Um, and um, with with the the whole hearts and minds, because they really did did pioneer this, Tom Harrison, and uh, and I think that we can learn those those what they implemented and what. How they um, won over the darks in Borneo. Um, it, it's still it's a template which yeah. which can be used today. You know, if you look at Afghanistan, for example, I don't think we did a very good job there. We we tended to go in there and uh, in, in, you know, talking a few going a few years back, being a little bit um, yeah, I mean, arrogant and ignorant, and um, uh, I think. Uh, didn't treat the people with the respect that uh, they merited. Thought that we knew best um, because we had modern equipment and modern weapons, and um, uh, and that's of course that could have easily have been the mindset of of Tom Harrison and the the, the Australian boys, and they inserted into Borneo, but they didn't. They went there open minded. So I think I think that's really sort of the thing that. I really enjoyed writing the book, um, particularly mm. the Borneo aspect, because I didn't know I learned so much. Um, and I just, I just think it's fascinating, and not just in a military context. I just think everywhere, and I, I do quite a lot of traveling myself, and I always try to go uh, to a new country open and experience a new cu- culture open minded. And I think we are um, still guilty. I think it's visceral in the West that we do tend to think. That we know best um, because we're richer and we have um, more sophisticated mod cons, etc. But um, don't, and if uh, often we know, uh, uh, we know least, we know less in in many yeah, cases it, than. Yes, sir. A template is a great word there. It's it's a it's a lesson to us as travellers. I mean, living in Normandy, as I've been making my living as a tour guy, you know, I've met lots of groups from America or Britain who. Who, when they come to France, they just stick with pizza and McDonald's because they don't want to try anything different. And you think, I mean, it's yeah. this is France. It's not. It's not Borneo. You're not going to get monkey brain on toast or anything. It's just you know something different. You pate or something. But people can be very um, frightened of new experiences. And I think if my takeaway from your book is the people who excelled in this unit were those, as you said yourself earlier, who just embrace. They leapt in two feet, embraced it. And and wanted to take from the the locals as well as give to them, and I think that's it. It's about atti- it's about mental attitude, yes. isn't it? Go in there to to learn yeah. and but not not be scared of it. No, I mean I think absolutely. If you're if you if you treat the world with an open mind, then the world is your oyster. And Jack Treadra, who I mentioned, he was a medical man. He died in two thousand and eighteen, age ninety eight. 
And up until I think the last year of his life, he went back regularly to, to Borneo. He'll take a small uh, light aircraft in and uh, there were still one or two people who had been in the village when he'd uh, uh, dropped in. And that's what it meant wow. to him. And he, you know, was, he said, these people are in me. Um, kindness they, that they showed me and just generally the accepting me um, uh, I've never forgotten it and and you know 70 years later I think that's that just shows you the bond that they formed and the the bond that bond was able to be formed because both Jack Treadera and his special Z buddies were open-minded and the darks were open-minded too well, that seems like a perfect way to end things for today. So I'm just going to remind folks what we've got coming up next week. So I'll be I'll be back with you in a second, um, Jack, Gavin. So don't go away. But folks, nothing over the weekend. And then next week, I'm we begin what I'm calling Minorities Week. So we've got some shows about Caribbean air crews with Mark Johnson. That's on Monday. We're looking at the uh, treatment of experiences of of female and non-white Russians in the Red Army. We've got a show about the organization of the Indian Army. And there's another one or two shows I'm still working on. So it's interesting subjects. We're not we're not trying to, you know, bang a drum about unfairness and prejudice, although those subjects will come up. We're just trying to spotlight some of the units and forces that made up the allies uh but uh, units we don't always think about and particularly i'm looking forward to the show about the experience of uh people of color in south africa in world war ii and how that all connects in connects in with um, apartheid and attitude it'll be really good stuff so as usual the links you need are in the description below I'll hold up the gavin's book one more time there uh zed special unit by gavin mortimer and everything by gavin sas lrdg merrill's was all worth reading i've got little gavin mortimer section on my bookshelf <laughs> so i'll bring gavin back in to say good evening and thanks very much for talking to us did you enjoy talking to our little group of uh enthusiasts today oh i loved it now it's been really good to uh just to talk and yeah to spread the word about zed special unit and uh and uh and what we can learn from them today still brilliant well on that note we will leave it so this is paul woodad for world war ii tv saying i will see you all again next week enjoy your week weekend folks and thanks very much everybody for watching and your comments cheers everybody bye <laughs>